This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard-to-find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is professional golfer Lauren Roberts. <laughs> The boss of the moss wasn't born in the Bluff City, but everyone knows Lauren Roberts is a Memphian. Lauren has called Memphis home for well over 20 years and is proud of it. He's a humanitarian who gives his time, energy, and money to a cause that's dear to his heart, helping children at Labonner Children's Medical Center and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. He's also a major supporter of the First Tee of Memphis. On the links, 2014 wasn't the best for the four-time major winner on the Champions Tour, as he finished 55th on the Charles Schwab points list. Lauren has won nearly $30 million in his career on the PGA and Champions Tours and has captured more than 20 titles. He's also been a member of the U.S. Ryder Cup and President's Cup teams. Today, Lauren Roberts on his career, his future in the game, and the issues haunting the Ryder Cup team. It's all next on Sports Files. Lord, great to see you again. Thanks for being with us. Greg, thanks for having me on again. All right, 2014 season yeah. is done on the Champions Tour. Right. How did it go for you? A little down. A little down. <laughs> sure. I, you know, I, uh, you know uh, I feel like I could have played better, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. It's pretty funny to be almost 60 and say you're a work in progress, right. but I'm still, still working. I just love playing golf. I love being out there. And, and so, you know, I'm always thinking that next year is going to be a good year, but... Um, I've played pro golf for 35 years now, since 1981, so I'm thinking, well, you know, hey, but I still enjoy being around it. Yeah, so you never lose that competitiveness. It's always, it's in your nature, but are, are there times when you're out there and you're going city to city and out of the country that you're thinking, you know, I, I need a rest? No, I tell you, I love it. I, I still love being out there. And I tell you, all you got to do is watch Jay Haas, and that puts enough fuel in my tank, you know, because right. he's right. going to turn 60 here shortly, or already has, and uh, he's uh, just just playing awesome. So it's like he kind of motivates all of us, especially us guys that are a little older that are still playing out there. He motivates all of us, and uh, and you obviously you got Hale Irwin that's shooting his age every week. You know, right. he's 68 years old now, for heaven's sakes. I mean, he's still out there grinding it. So. Uh, those are the guys that like to play and like to compete, and I feel like I'm one of them. What the heck's going on with Bernhard Longer? Every week that guy seems to be there. <laughs> He's just, he is the dominator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that's, I'm telling you, that's the way he looks at it. He just loves to prepare and loves to play and loves to compete. You love to play, you love to compete. Right. Are you willing to get into the gym? Are you willing to do all the things that you had to do all those years to make yeah. you such the, the competitor you are on the PGA Tour and on the Champions Tour? Are you ready to do that at your age? I'm doing it more now than I was when I was playing the regular tour. Wow. I, I really am. You know, I've got, I got to work on my hips. I got to work on stretching. I mean, it, let's face it, when you get older, the best thing you can do for golf is to work on your core. Mm -hmm. and work on your hamstrings, your, your glutes, and your hip flexors, you, you, you've got to stretch. That's the best thing that even the average person that likes to play golf as they get a little older, you've got to stretch, and that's what it is. You, you've got to keep some flexibility through the middle of your body. From the start of the Champions Tour when, when you jumped on there mm -hmm. to now in 2014, yeah. has that changed any? It really has. When I first came out, 2005, um, you know, I don't want to say that it was an exhibition tour, but it was more of an exhibition tour. You know, a lot of the guys were older guys and having a great time. Uh, 
now it's gotten to be a lot more competitive tour. Right. Guys are staying out on the regular tour until they turn 50 and come right out. And that's a huge plus. That's what I did. That's what Jay did. We were some of the first guys that really stayed active on the regular tour until the day they turned 50 and came out in the Champions Tour. And it's become a much more competitive tour. I can tell you now they probably added at least two to 300 yards in length every week that we play now. Wow. Unless the golf course is an old course we've been playing, you can't move it back any farther. But mm -hmm. every week now we're playing at least one or two par fours that are in the 470 range, you know, 480 range. Uh, we, uh, you, you've got to hit it, and you've got to be a lot more competitive out there now. Many of the guys who were accomplished on the PGA Tour mm -hmm. have been good on the Champions Tour, but there's also those guys who were marginal right. to even below average on the regular tour, right. and all of a sudden now they have a new, leaf on, a new lease on life, so they're trying to take advantage of it. So you see right. some names that you're not familiar right. with that are doing well. You know, guys that have maybe won once or twice in 20 years in the regular tour, and then right. also they come out and they win two or three, four times. Prime example, Scott Dunlop is a prime example. Never won on the regular tour. Now he's come out and won twice on the championship. I mean, it's a confidence thing. Let's just say, right? It, it is a confidence thing. The day you turn 50, you know you're the youngest guy out there. You know, you're, you're the stud. You're the, you're the young rookie. Mm -hmm. And... If it fuels your confidence, you're going to play good. I don't care what sports you play. If you have confidence, that really fuels your competitive desire, and it also gives you an advantage. I mean, it just you just think better about how you play. You say to yourself, look, I'm 50. i got to be able to beat that 60-year-old guy. Exactly. I, I, exactly. When, you, when you're talking about the regular tour, 25 and 35, not that much difference. When mm -hmm. you talk the Champions Tour, you're talking 50 and 60, that's a huge difference. Absolutely. What's your favorite <laughs> one or two courses that you play on the Champions Tour? You know, the Champions Tour now, we're moving to some older type courses. We, we've probably one of my favorite. We used to, we played the Players' Championship up in Pittsburgh. And obviously, Oakmont gets all the publicity in Pittsburgh for all the history that's happened there. But there's a place called Fox Chapel, which is an old Seth Rayner golf course, I think 1913, 1914, so around it. It is my favorite because it's classic. It's got every hole that Seth Rayner ever did. And if you know golf, you know he's one of the old, old classic ar architects, along you know, with Donald Ross and Alistair right. McKenzie and stuff. And he did every hole that he ever did. He was always famous for uh, his par three. So he's got this Baritz par three there, which is, you know, it's got the big flag. And then it goes down, literally goes down in a ditch, the green, it comes back up and it goes back up. It's, a, it's an old Baritz. Right. He's got that on there. He's got the Redan par three, which is the old right to left with the green sloping away. Mm -hmm. Then he's, he's done a, a uh, reverse Redan, which he never did anywhere else, really, that I've ever seen. And it's, it goes the other way. It goes left to right, which he never did anywhere else. So it, it's a classic old golf course. I like anything built before 1940, I love it. <laughs> Except uh, you're not yeah. using the old golf clubs. You're using <laughs> right, the modern the... <laughs> club. That is certainly a bother. I don't right. want to get into, like, all, yeah. the, all the changes. because. It, but for you personally, from what you used, let's say, 10 years ago in your bag, right. what's different now? Well, obviously the driver's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I still every now and then I'll go out in the back of the range out at Southwind and, and take my old steel shafted persimmon headed woods out there and, and try to hit a few balls just to see. And it's amazing because, you know, you've got the new golf ball, right. okay, the new two piece and three piece golf balls. They don't have the wound cores and, and, and the liquid centers anymore. And so I go out there and I try to hit these. I can't even get the ball in the air with these old clubs. The, the new balls don't even go in the air. You hit these just these little low shrimps out there like right. that until you're really trying to work it, you know. The driver is the best club in the bag as far as improvement-wise. I play in Pro-Ams every week. And it used to be that the hardest club in the bag for the amateur to hit was the driver. Now it's the easiest club in the bag to hit. Most amateurs I play, they can get it out there 230, 240 yards and get it somewhere in the vicinity. It's everything else after that. Now the wet, hardest club in the bag for the amateur to hit's the wedge. <laughs> wow, that, that has changed. You know, we, we often, we watch tennis in this mm -hmm. day and age. Big oversized racket, right. big uh, serve, right. no rallies going on anymore. Right. Will we ever get to a point in golf where We've kind of hurt the sport because of the equipment is so advanced. Well, I think on on the pro level now is really a lot different than the really good amateur level. Okay. Okay. When you talk about you know your club champion or your good players at your club or your course or wherever you play at, 
Now it's become such a power game. Uh, the drivers, the balls, if you were a long hitter before, now with the new equipment, it's just exponentially made you a lot more longer. Mm -hmm. every, every mile an hour club head speed you can pick up now with the new stuff, I mean, it, with the new balls, it just multiplies it. And so, I mean, you, you look at the guys on the regular tour now, pretty much everybody out there hits the ball 300 yards right. off the tee. Right. So. I want to talk Ryder Cup. Oh, boy. 1995. Part of the Ryder mm -hmm. Cup team, the U.S. Ryder Cup team. You guys lost, but yeah. you were three and one. You had a great yeah. Ryder Cup. Yeah. You played on President's Cup teams as right. well that won. Right. What's what's wrong? What's the problem? Could it be as simple as the Europeans are just better? Or is that blasphemy, Lauren? Well, you know, you if you look at the world rankings, there's an awful lot of Europeans that are in the top 20 of the, right. the rankings. So. Obviously, they have really improved their ability. They've got so many more good players than they used to have. Now, I can go in the, into this long dissertation about what I think it is, but I think there's, there's, there's two things that I think the PGA of America has to address okay. in this. One is that the PGA Tour is different from the PGA of America. The PGA of America are all the club pros. They run the PGA Championship, and they run the Ryder Cup. The PGA Tour is separate. We're the players' division. We're our, our totally own entity. Okay. Now, the PGA Tour supplies the players. The PGA of America holds the championship, holds the Ryder Cup. You go to Europe. You look at what Europe did several years ago. I think back in the late 70s, they kind of went in. Tony Jacklin had a lot to do with this. They went, and the PGA European Tour and the PGA uh, professionals of Europe got together we are still separate in America, PJ Tour versus PJ of America. They got together when it came to the Ryder Cup. They share in the revenue now. The PJ Tour doesn't share in any revenue created by the PJ of America. Okay. Okay. And they make millions off of that. Okay. We, sh we, we are totally separate from the PGA of America when it comes to the Ryder Cup. Europe is together. The PGA Tour of Europe and the PGA Association of Europe. They are together on the money they make on it. They are together. They're captains. Captain. Uh, they have another contest, and I can't remember the name of it, but it, it's the same kind of a Ryder Cup form, but they play against other countries in Europe. They. There's cohesion. Yeah, right, there's, there's cohesion. They, 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 they train their captains ahead of time. They just don't pick a captain out of the clipper. They know who's going to be the captain right. years in advance. They train them. They get ready for this thing. There's cohesion there. In America, we need to get, my personal view, we need to get that cohesion back to, so that we work together. So the players, and obviously, I'm not going to say players don't feel strongly about it. They do. Anytime that you play for your flag, anytime that you play for your comf country, you are totally into it. That is a huge prideful thing for you to be able to be selected to do that. But I'm just saying we need to get both organizations together on this thing so that we're working, Makes so sense. that we're planning two years ahead. It's not that they name a captain and and two years later there's no cohesion about how we gonna, how we're going to approach this, how we're going to work on our teams. It has to be together. The other issue is the President's Cup. You brought it up. Uh, Europe every two years they're in this. We are playing a, a same kind of thing every year and sometimes I think that kind of cuts into the two-year preparation. They have two years to prepare, we just have the one year. Would you get rid of the President's Cup? Well, I mean, the reason the President's came, came about is because we had so many Australian, right, to so, face many, the so, other guys so many South African mm -hmm. players that played this tour in the U.S. They said, hey, we don't have a place to play. So that's why that was formed. You were a co-captain one year as well right. as being a player. Right. There is going to be a task force created. We've heard okay. from Phil Mickelson, who was very mm -hmm. vocal about this very year's vocal. Ryder Cup, uh, right. especially about Tom Watson. We've heard yeah. Tiger Woods is going to be a part of it. Do you think this is the answer maybe to find that cohesiveness? And if they ever asked you to be a part of it, having been both a player and a captain, would you want to be a part of it? Well, yeah, but generally you, you have to have won a major championship on the regular tour uh, you know, to be involved in it in that manner. Uh, I think it's great to get everybody's opinion, but you have to come up with some sort of a consensus. And the bigger the group, the tougher it is to get a consensus. All right? Mm -hmm. They need to come up, and I agree with them coming when they come up with a plan. They need to come up with a plan on how to approach this and stick to it. Uh, but 
when it comes down to it, the players have to show up and play that week. And if you look at some of our guys, the records are not that good. Right, right. That are dominant players that have played in it four and five and six times. And you need to show up with your game and play. And obviously you can do all the planning you want, and that might help the guys buy into it more if it's more of a two-year preparation consensus type deal, Makes I think. Sense. But you still got to show up and play. Lauren, give me a minute on on what you've done over the years uh, since you arrived in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of your time, your energy, your, your sweat has been given to <laughs> Uh, help out uh, the, the kids at Le Bonheur. Mm -hmm. I know it's dear to your heart. Yeah. We, we, did, we were very fortunate to do a fundraiser. I believe we did it for 11 years for Le Bonheur. And um, initially we started out as raising money for the sickle cell program down there. Obviously, I believe that has transferred over now to St. Jude. And so now we are, that money that we raised there now goes towards, uh, I believe it's the infant cardiac or infant care preemie care facility right, that's right. down there and nice. um, you know being with the, the tournament here and you know obviously St. Jude has been a sponsor uh, for a long time and been involved with the Memphis tournament for so long I mean if you're a player and you go down and you visit those kids at, whether it's at Le Bonheur during tournament week or if it's at St. Jude tournament week and you're struggling. Why well, I'm not hitting that seven iron very good? And, like <laughs> right. I and you go and see these kids that are fighting for their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it puts just things it, it puts things in a, in a much different perspective for you. And I just feel honored to have the little bit of involvement that I've had. But there's so many people in Memphis here that do so many good sure. things in the city. Sure. There's so many good things happening in the city that I think really that needs to be promoted. All right, we're going to move on to something we call okay. five for the road. I'm going to need quick answers to five oh questions. Okay. Before I do that, real quick, how many? Uh, they tell me in my ear that you just had a recent hole in one. How many holes in one have you had in your career? Fourteen. Fourteen. Damn. <laughs> Fourteen. All right, here we go. Time for five for the road. Okay. Uh, your favorite professional sports team all time? Oh, it's the San Francisco Giants. I'm from California. So you're pretty happy. I'm a Giant guy. Three and five it. years. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. World Series titles. And hey, Mr. Kane. That's From right, Memphis. Matt, Matt, yeah, Kane, Matt, Matt Kane, Kane, big part of that. Yeah. Not this year with Not the injury, year, but, but certainly a big right. part of that. Uh, favorite professional athlete of all time? Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, you were talking about the Giants. Yeah. You, you go back. Uh, well, you're not that old. I, but you go back to say, hey, kid. It's with another It's with another team, I have okay. to tell you, that, but Sandy Koufax. Oh. I, I, I used to play, I got the chance to play golf with Sandy Koufax. Did you really? When he was in California, he'd, re he'd retired. He lived up where I used to live in San Luis Obispo area. We used to go out and play golf on Mondays to get all the local professionals. We all get together to have big money games. Absolutely. And, and I, I, I really admired him because he was such a great guy off the diamond, you know, too. Right. I've heard so many great stories about him. Yeah. And he got out early. He surprised a lot of people by he retiring did. early. Yeah. Favorite music? What oh, do you like to listen I, to? I'm a jazz guy. Jazz guy? Yeah. Any particular jazz Rick, Rick Braun. Rick? I'll have to look him up. Yeah, okay. Favorite movie of all time? <laughs> I'm an old classic guy. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, Gone with the Wind. That's Really? Yeah, Gone with the yeah, Wind? Yeah, yeah. And okay. a cl close second would be My Fair Lady behind that. That's kind of a chick flick, but, you know, hey, I, 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 you know, I <laughs> sure like your that. wife probably enjoyed watching it with <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, right. All right, from movie to TV show, yeah. what do you like to watch? What's your favorite TV show? Squawk Box on CNBC. No. Squawk Box <laughs> on CNBC. My favorite TV show. Oh gosh, they're all old ones. You know, I just remember as a kid growing up. Remember all those shows on TV? They used oh. to have Rat Patrol oh, and Combat and all this. Those so you are, like you like the old school stuff. Stuff. I'm old school. Hey, you, I told nothing. you I like every golf course built before 1940. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with being old school. Lauren, right, always Jake. a pleasure. All right, great. Thank Thanks. you so much. I appreciate it. We'll take a quick break. Right. Overtime is next. Don't look now, but the Memphis Tigers and only coach Justin Fuente's third season at the helm 
are closing in on a bowl game and are smack in the middle of the race for supremacy in the American Athletic Conference. The Tigers are in a five-way tie for the conference lead, and with five wins already to their credit, they have surpassed last season's win total by two with four games remaining. Tomorrow, the Tigers face Temple in Philly. Last Friday, it was Tulsa who became their fifth victim of the season. The last time the Memphis Tigers played in a bowl game was back in 2008. They now are one win away from becoming bowl eligible after picking up their fifth win of the season, a 40 to 20 win over Tulsa. It was a slow start for the Tigers as Jarvis Cooper fumbles inside the Tigers 10 yard line. DeMarco Nelson picks it up at the six and rumbles in for a touchdown and the Golden Hurricane grab a seven nothing lead late in the first quarter. A Jake Elliott 53 yard field goal, one of his four field goals on the night, cut the margin to 7-3. But then Derek Patterson on the receiving end of this 28 yard pass from Dane Evans, he cashes it in for six and the Golden Hurricane go up 14 to three. Paxton Lynch leads the Tigers on a drive, a three yard keeper on the bootleg makes it 14 to 10. Another Elliott field goal, this one from 37 yards, cut the deficit to one at 14 to 13. And then one of the big plays of the game, 14 seconds remaining before the half, and look at Brandon Hayes go. 51 yards to the land of happy thoughts, and the Memphis fans were happy because the Tigers grabbed their first lead at 20 to 14. The third quarter saw only a couple of Jake Elliott field goals, one of 47 and one of 51 yards, but the Memphis defense held Tulsa to just 64 yards of total offense. Memphis had a 26-14 lead moving into the fourth quarter when Brandon Hayes struck again. This time, he goes on a 30-yard jaunt. Hayes would rush for 197 net yards. The Tigers go up 33-14. After a late Tulsa touchdown, cut the margin to 33-20, it was Brandon Hayes once again putting the lights out on the Golden Hurricane as he scored with just under three minutes to go. This one from 14 yards out, and the Tigers win it 40 to 20. And now the Tigers head to Philadelphia to take on Temple tomorrow night, their second straight week playing on Friday evening. If they can get the win in this 6:30 kickoff, they get the six wins and become bowl eligible. And well, I couldn't be happier to get out of the, this game with a win. Um, we knew it was going to be like this, you know, the, Everybody tried to tell us that it wouldn't be like this, but we knew that it would. It would, and um, you know our kids didn't panic when things weren't going very well, and I'm awfully proud of that. But I think part of that's because we were prepared for a dogfight today. We knew what it was going to be like, and uh, we've seen Tulsa continue to get better and make huge improvements. And so we tried. You know, we did a good job getting ready. I'm proud of our kids. We've kind of turned our focus into each week trying to go 1-0. and And I don't think, me personally, this is an opinion, but I don't feel like there's a nickel's worth of difference between maybe the second team in this league and everybody else. You know, there may be one team in this league that's a little bit better than everybody else. We'll find out. I mean, I've seen them on TV. They look pretty good, East Carolina. But I don't think there's a nickel's worth of difference between anybody else. And... That's a dangerous thing to be in if you start looking ahead to anything. So uh, we know what lies ahead of us uh, can be very treacherous. Some, some teams that maybe don't have good records that absolutely can beat us. So um, we've really tried to turn it down on the six talk and talk about winning one game a week. I think we just, as a whole, we just came out kind of slow, came out kind of sluggish, um, and we needed that spark. Um, and, you know, we ended up getting it in the second half slowly but surely, but it was enough to, you know, get a W, so we can't complain. But he, he informed us at the beginning of the week uh, that they, about the situation that was going on. It was, he, he didn't make it a big deal. He just wanted us to prepare the same way we do. He just said, go out and get the W. Don't make it about him. Make it about us. Um, make it about the team. Make sure we come out and do the things we're supposed to do, and uh, that's what we did. Game's winding down first half, it's 14 to three. Brandon Hayes runs for a touchdown. How big was that TD right before half? It gave us a whole lot of momentum as far as the defense standpoint. We love seeing B. Hayes run. You know, he's a great runner on and off the field. Um, as far as practicing, he's practice hard. Like I call him, I call him a tote man. He's like a little machine to me. So I like seeing him do that because I know he got it in him. 
The Ole Miss Rebels chance at an SEC title and appearance in the first ever playoff was hit with a crippling blow last weekend when they lost a heartbreaker to Auburn at home 35-31. The Rebels fell from 4th to 11th in this week's selection committee top 25. Unbeaten Mississippi State, which held off Arkansas 17-10, remains number one. On the hardwood, the Memphis Grizzlies are out of the gate quickly after winning their first four games of the season, heading into last night's game at Phoenix. Zach Randolph produced double-doubles in all four games. The Grizzlies continue their road trip at injury-riddled Oklahoma City tomorrow night and Milwaukee on Saturday. They return home Tuesday to face Kobe Bryant and the L.A. Lakers. And that'll do it for now. Remember, you can see any of our previous shows by simply heading to our website, WKNO.org, and clicking on KNO Tonight. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard-to-find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files.